First Thessalonians chapter 3, and this chapter brings us to Paul's concern for the spiritual state of this church that he had planted. In the first two chapters, Paul had reviewed what they had experienced together during his visit to them in person. Chapters 1 and 2 were looking back at their faith in the past, how they received the word of God, how they turned from idols to serve God, and Paul was encouraging them. But from chapter 3 onwards, now Paul moves to his heart for them in the present and moving forward. It was great how they had started with Christ, but Paul was deeply concerned how they were doing now after he had been separated from them for a few months through that persecution that had risen from the envious Jews in the city. You know, Jesus cares about our lives. And he especially cares about the state of our walk with him. We could say our spiritual life, our relationship with God. Now, God cares about every part of our life, he cares about our relationships, he cares about our health, he cares about our business, he cares about how we're doing in every part of life. But the spiritual life is the part that affects everything else the most. If our relationship with Jesus is active and healthy and biblical and growing, then every other area of our life will receive strength, will receive what it needs, will, will be improved and become more healthy. Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And when we're growing in our faith, God will strengthen us. For every other issue that we're facing, he'll provide the wisdom we need. He'll provide the strength to handle whatever we're facing. And so Paul was concerned for their spiritual state. He wanted to know how they were doing. Were they growing in their faith? And when I think of this, I, I think of a, an illustration of gardening. I, I like to get out in the garden in the spring. I'm looking forward to it once the snow is all gone and it gets warm. And sometimes, you know, I grew up in the UK. We had a lot of trees there. I like trees. It's just, I don't know, I like them. And when they start to grow, even just suddenly there's a little tree growing, if it's in a decent place, I want to help it. I want to do everything I can to help it grow. I like larch trees. We have, uh, in Alberta, there's a beautiful walk in mountains where all these trees turn like bright yellowy orange in, in the fall. And we have a couple of larch trees in our property, and there's a space where there was a gap and suddenly, a little larch tree was coming up. And, and it was like a picture of how God plants a church, how God saves people. God does it. And yet, like Paul, I have the responsibility now to nurture and to help the, that tree to grow. And Paul said, you know, the Lord saved you. But, but as a pastor, as, as an apostle, Paul wanted to nurture their faith and help them grow. When this little larch tree is growing, I want to make sure the, there's space for the roots. There's good fertilizer put down on it. There's, there's water for it. And if anything's coming to block the light, I want to remove it. And what I should have done was put some kind of fence around it this winter because all the deer in our area came and ate it. <laughs> so I wasn't a very good, you know, gardener. <laughs> but the Lord wants us to nurture our spiritual life, our relationship with him. And it takes some effort. It takes some work. And so for this Sunday and also for next Sunday, as we come into this part of Thessalonians, chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul is going to express his concern for their growth, for their spiritual life. And really in three main areas, we could call it three categories of spiritual growth and health. One we'll talk about mostly today was how they were, were to be strong in the face of great trials and suffering. And this was a sign of spiritual condition, of how they could endure suffering. But also, Paul will talk about how they need to continue growing in loving other people, loving each other. Love is a great you know, gauge of our condition. And then the other one he's going to talk about is how he's going to encourage them to walk in personal purity and become well-pleasing to the Lord in holiness. And so as we begin our, our look at this section of Scripture, 
How are you doing in these areas? How's your faith when trials come? How's the love you have expressed toward others? And how's your personal walk of purity going? This next couple weeks will be really great to examine this and talk about how we grow as Christians, how we develop our roots and then bring forth the fruit. So let's pick it up here in chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to spend most of our time in the first five verses, but we are going to get through the whole chapter, Lord willing. (laughs) Verse 1, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For, in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter attempted you and our labor might be in vain. Paul basically says to them here, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to come back and visit with you yet. That was in the last chapter as well. But Paul's saying, I did the next best thing I could do. I sent my assistant Timothy to come and minister to you. I didn't want you to be overcome by trials and suffering and and tempted by the devil to give up on your faith. So I sent Timothy to establish you and to encourage you. There are some amazing lessons in these verses that we can learn from the way that Paul chose to send Timothy back to the Thessalonians in the early days of this young church. First lesson, Paul really cared for the church in Thessalonica. We studied how he came into the city as an evangelist, but he didn't just want to lead them to Christ and leave. He invested in them. He spent a few weeks with them to help them grow and become disciples, and then he was chased out of town by those Uh, that mob that came from the unbelieving Jews as they gathered those evil men in the marketplace and caused a riot. Paul didn't want to leave. He wanted to help them grow. And at this time, he hasn't been able to come back, but he loves them, and he was concerned for their state. He'd like he'd he'd been ripped away from them. And you see in verse 1, he says, I can't stand it anymore. We could no longer endure it. So we sent Timothy to find out how you're doing, and to establish you and encourage you. So Paul had a genuine burden for the spiritual state of the flock, and I can think of three obvious reasons why he was concerned for them. First of all, they were young believers. They'd only just come out of an idol-worshipping lifestyle, and so they were vulnerable to a relapse back into their old life. Secondly, they were already facing a direct attack of persecution, And so they were vulnerable to fear and physical danger for saying they're Christians and living for Christ. And thirdly, Paul, having been chased out of town, was now isolated from them as the the pastor, as the shepherd. He couldn't be with them. And so they were vulnerable to the dangers of isolation. And now they're a bit like sheep who don't have a shepherd. They had the Lord. They had each other. So they would be able to grow and continue. But Paul also knew They could really use the help of a shepherd to help them stand strong. So the first thing we can learn here is that when we come to Christ, God's concern is that we also build our roots down deep and we grow our faith. May God make us, like Paul, those kind of caring believers who look out for others and want to help them to grow their faith that we're loved and that God is with us and that God wants to help us. And God does. He provides. And I thank God he's provided spiritual leaders for us. He's provided caring brothers and sisters in the church family. And we need to have an open heart and respond well to those mature Christians and receive their heart of love and genuine care when they reach out to us. And God make us those kind of people like Paul's heart here. So secondly... Paul not only cared for them, but he was willing to make personal sacrifices to help them grow. Did you see that in verse 1? He says, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy to you. Now, this wasn't easy for Paul. 
You remember he had only a small team of missionaries, Silas, Timothy, and Dr. Luke. They were run out of Thessalonica, and they went to Berea. And God started a church there too. And then those envious Jews followed them. Literally, the persecutors were stalking them. And they came and chased them out of Berea as well. And so Paul, it says in Acts that he and Dr. Luke go down south in Greece to Athens so that things can cool down in that region. But he left behind Silas and Timothy in northern Greece to minister to the churches. And then he sent for them and they came. And then it seems like Paul here sends Timothy back. He says, they need more ministry. And Timothy, you're going to go to Thessalonica and you're going to spend time with them, even though it meant Paul was in a place of vulnerability himself as his team was split up. Now, if you were being chased from city to city, wouldn't you want your small group of friends and your team to stay with you? I sure would. And that's actually a time when Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians. He goes from Athens to Corinth, and he says, I was among you Corinthians in fear and trembling. This was a time for Paul of fear and trembling, where he would have been discouraged, where he could have had been vulnerable to depression and to danger, and yet he cared for that church, and he sent Timothy, and he remained alone just with Dr. Luke. And this is the heart of Jesus. Real leaders are willing to make personal sacrifices to help others who are in need. And we can all learn from this. We're all called to serve the Lord first and then consider the needs of others, not just ourselves. Now, there's another thing we can learn. Look at verse 2. Paul not only loved them and made sacrifices, but he explains why he sent Timothy. Verse 2 says, We sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Now, first, who, who is this guy, Timothy? Maybe you're not too sure who this guy really is. Well, he was a young disciple. He was a student of the Apostle Paul. And Timothy had only joined up with Paul recently, a few months before this. And he was so young, he was maybe even a teenager at the time. And Paul had seen the, the call of God in his life over in the other area of, of Turkey where he had been uh, planting churches and going back, and he saw this young guy there. And he, he had been trained in the, the scriptures by his grandmother and by his mother, and he had faith. And Paul said, I, I see the call of God in your life. And he invited Timothy to come along and join him. And Paul was discipling him. And, and he was young. And he'd only been walking with Paul for, for months, not even a year yet. And yet, look how Paul describes Timothy in verse 2. He says, he's our brother and a, and a minister of God and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. This tells us a lot about ministry, doesn't it? First thing is that it's about family. He's our brother. And when we're in the ministry, we really build that family relationship. It doesn't just mean he was saved. It means Paul's saying, I'm sending to you my own son in the faith. Later on, Paul calls him that. He's our brother. Secondly, Paul calls him the minister of God. Now, in those days, the word minister was not a formal title. Today, sometimes people say that. I, I even have had people call me minister or reverend and i'm like okay just call me you know colin or, or pastor colin at the most but in those days this term minister was an informal word for someone who works behind the scenes or literally someone who waits on tables we get the word deacon from it deaconos and it means someone who's committed to serving for jesus sake someone who humbly cares for people without looking for a title or, 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 you know, attention. And Paul is saying Timothy has a servant heart. He's a humble man. He's dependable. He's working hard in the kingdom of God. And the third description in verse 2 there is he's our fellow laborer in the gospel. And that reveals that Paul felt Timothy was, you could say, in synergy with Paul, a fellow laborer. The word literally is synergos in the Greek. And it's a compound word of in sync and the work. He's, he's in sync in the work. And it means he came alongside Paul. It means he worked with him as a fellow laborer. It says in the gospel. So essentially, Timothy was the kind of guy, he wasn't like, look at me. He wasn't a lone ranger. 
He wasn't like many young guys having a bit of an ego thinking, I'll come along under Paul so I can see a stepping stone and then when I get a chance to go on my own, I'll really show everyone I know better. <laughs> no, no, Paul said, he's, he's with me, he's humble, he's working under me, he's working alongside me. And Paul makes other great comments later in other letters. And he says, Timothy was the only, he, there was no one like Timothy who would sincerely care for the state of the churches the way Paul did. And Timothy was so like-minded. He had a proven character, Paul said. So I love that. We can really learn lots here. You know, God equips us for the ministry we're called to. And it's not about our age. It's not about our education. It's not about our experience. It's about God's call and responding to God's call and saying, yes, Lord, use me. So Paul and Timothy here is a great example of discipleship. Jesus discipled his men through relationships. And then he sent the disciples out. Paul discipled Timothy by bringing him along and training him and being an example. And then he sent him out. And then come back and let's review. Let's talk this through. We mustn't forget the importance of intentional discipleship and building those relationships. This means sharing our lives and serving together and learning from one another. We can learn how to live for Jesus together. We can learn how to serve the Lord from each other. In my own journey with the Lord, I can say I've learned a lot from books. I've learned quite a lot from sermons. But I've learned the most from people in, in the relationship. And by being with them and by learning the ministry through the genuine care of discipleship and the, their, learning their experiences and examples in my life. People who've cared for me, people who believe in God's call on my life, who can speak truth into my life and have walked with me through life. And so Paul and Timothy is a great example here of how we can really learn to grow and learn the ministry through relationship. Now, what was Timothy's mission? Look at verse 2. I sent him to establish you and encourage you. Two things. You're going to go back to Thessalonica, Timothy, to establish them and to encourage the Christians. And the original word here for establish, it means to make stable, to make solid, to make firm, so that it does not fall. And the image is used of stabilizing something with a support, with a brace. It's a bit like gardening, that, that new little tree's coming up. I've got to put a stake in the ground or something and, and make sure it can handle those early days so the roots can take the time to grow deep. It's a bit like when Moses was fighting that battle in prayer and he put his hands in the air and he was getting tired. And his two guys, Mo, uh, Aaron and Hur, came and, and they supported him. They established him. They held up his arms. And so Timothy was going to go back to the Corinthians, uh, sorry, back to the Thessalonian Christians to ground them in the truths of God, to stabilize them, to establish them, because they were undergoing persecution. And in the same way, we need to develop our roots of our faith by studying the Bible, by learning the foundations of the Word of God. So he's going to establish them, but he's also going to, did you see the second one? Encourage them. And the Greek word here means to come alongside someone, to put an arm around them and bolster them in their situation. Sometimes the word is conveying comfort. Sometimes the word is conveying exhortation. But always the root of this word is to enable a person to meet a difficult situation with confidence. And that's what it means to encourage people in their faith. Timothy was going to help them establish their foundations through the teaching of the word of God, but also encourage them to keep going forward in the midst of what they were facing. And this takes relationship, takes that personal question, how are you doing? What are you facing? How can I pray for you? And it takes some openness on the other side to say, well, <laughs> actually, I need prayer for what I'm going through. And Timothy went there to bring great encouragement. You know, I just got to say, you guys remind me of this church in Thessalonica because your foundations go deep. You love the word of God. You study. But you're also people who love to encourage each other. And you've received that from the people, Bruce and Melody, who founded this church, great encouragers. And you guys have that heart. And, 
and we love to receive that encouragement and, and give it to each other to keep going in what we're facing. We're praying for each other. We're here for you. And God will help you through. So there's a few things we can learn here. Paul had concern for the church. Paul made sacrifices for the church. Paul did whatever he could. He couldn't go himself, but he sent Timothy to help them grow in their faith. And verse 3 tells us why. Look at verse 3, why they needed this special visit at this time. He says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we're appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it has happened and you know, like there's this, oh man, you guys know you're going through some trials. So verse 3 and 4, Paul makes it clear they were going through these afflictions and his concern was that they could be shaken by those afflictions. But he also reminds them that he had already visited them, already led them to Christ, and then quickly he had warned them back when he had been with them, we are appointed to this. We're appointed to this? We're appointed to what? to suffer. This is part of the Christian journey. We told you when we were with you that you would suffer tribulation just as it has happened, and you guys know it. Keep your finger here, and let's turn back to the left to Acts chapter 14, and just see an example of how Paul started discipling people by talking about trials, talking about suffering. Acts chapter 14 and verse 21 is an example for us all. It says, verse 21, when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. This is the region in Turkey where Timothy's from, actually. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. There's that word, strengthening. And exhorting them, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Oh, really? <laughs> yep. And so it says in verse 23, they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting and they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And of course, Paul kept his journey going. But his, you know, I can just picture this in Thessalonica. These people have heard Paul preach. Like, go back to when he visited them. Careful with the microphone. <laughs> go back there. A few months before, Paul comes in, he preaches Jesus and they get it. The Holy Spirit helps them receive Christ. They respond by faith, and, and they quickly are kicked out of the synagogue within three weeks. So they start meeting from house to house. And you can imagine the new believers. They're saying, oh, work's done. Great. i got to eat my falafel, get my tzatziki in here, and then i got to go to Jason's house because Paul's going to give us another lesson tonight. And they ran over there, and they got together, and they started singing and praising God. And all those songs they had learned about the Messiah, now they made sense. It's Jesus, and I know him, and he's come to live in me. And the Holy Spirit was working in their lives, and they were praising God and singing. Paul was teaching them how to take communion. Paul was teaching them how to pray for each other in those houses. And then he would sit down and open the word of God and say, want to know the first lesson? And they would get their little writing tablet out the little iPad of the day, <laughs> get ready to take notes. And Paul says to them, the world will not accept you. The enemy of your soul, Satan, now is really going to hound you. You have a target on you for following Jesus. Don't be surprised. You're going to go through some trials. But God will be with you. And this was the foundational teaching. Verse 4 there, back in Thessalonians, turn back to 1 Thessalonians 3. He says in verse 4, We told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation. And so here, by the way, Paul is not talking about the great tribulation. When you see that word tribulation, it's not talking about the end times and, and the, the period of God's wrath that's coming. The great tribulation is, is different We'll get to the Great Tribulation later in this book, and also we'll do Second Thessalonians, I think, after. And there, we'll talk about the Great Tribulation. But here he's talking about daily tribulations and trials. The Great Tribulation coming, that, that's when God brings his wrath upon the unbelieving world. But right now, Satan is bringing his wrath, and people are bringing their wrath upon the believers, upon us, upon the church. By the way, there are some people who don't teach 
like Paul did. They teach what's called the prosperity gospel. Have you ever heard of that before? It's this whole teaching where basically if you really have faith, then God wants you to be perfectly happy, healthy, and wealthy. And there's this whole theology out there, and it sounds really, like, attractive. It sounds really deep, and, and it plays on the guilt conscience of sins we struggle with. And it's basically, if you just get your life right, then God will make you healthy. God will make you comfortable. God will make you prosperous. God will make you rich. Come to Jesus, and he'll take away all your problems. And sometimes that's how people share the gospel. Sometimes that's how people think they're growing in their faith. And they're doing their good deeds in order to get something from God and to earn his love. And, you know, there's a little bit of truth in there. There always is a little bit. God does want us to do well. God does want us to be blessed in many different ways. And actually, the Bible teaches when we obey him, we will avoid a whole lot of pain. <laughs> we'll avoid a whole lot of suffering that comes as a consequence of sin. And so obey God and it will go well with you. That's what, you know, the Lord said to people like Joshua. You'll, you'll prosper in your way when you're obeying the Lord. But does that mean that if we do God's will, we will avoid all suffering and we'll avoid all trials? And if you're going through a trial or suffering, it must be because of some sin that you need to confess. Is that always the truth? No, it certainly is not. Look at the life of Paul. Perhaps the most godly and impacting leader in, in the Christian history. Yet he was poor, he was sick, he was persecuted, and he suffered greatly, and he was killed for his faith. Look at the life of Jesus. Actually, he did God's will even more than anyone. And yet, he was poor, and he suffered in great ways. This is a tough truth. Part of the Christian life is that we will suffer. Part of actually obeying God and following God is that there will be a battle that goes on and that God will even appoint us, it says here, to suffering. Did you see that in verse 3? Interesting, isn't it? We have been appointed to this. When you're going through a trial and you know it's not because of some direct sin, it's not a consequence of an action, it's just out of your control. I'm going through this trial. Why, Lord, is this happening to me? You can take verse 3 and you can know that it's not an accident, it's an appointment. That God has a purpose, that God has a plan. And it's normal, it's part of the Christian life. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. But let none of you suffer, he goes on to say, because of your sin, because you're a murderer or a thief or an evil person or a busybody in other people's matters. If anyone suffers, though, living for Jesus, Peter says, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in your suffering. So obviously, there are times where suffering is related to an action, but there are also times where it's not where God actually brings us into an appointment of a trial of suffering. And part of it is the spiritual battle. Satan doesn't like you. The world doesn't like you. But be comforted. The Lord himself will be with you in all the trials of life. J John 16.33, Jesus taught this. He said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so no matter how hard the trials get in our lives, Jesus brings us the comfort and the strength we need to endure them. And that's why Paul says, you guys, you've got to get your head around this. You're going to go through some major trials. Now, a good question to ask at this point, and I want to maybe make this the main pause for application today, is to ask the question, why is suffering a necessary part of the Christian life? Like, what's the purpose? Like, Lord, can't you make our life just smooth and easy from here on out? Well, I've got six reasons that I see in Scripture, and I'm just going to list them and, and give you a verse for each. So get ready to write these down. Six reasons why we suffer, why God actually wills it and appoints it that we suffer. Number one is suffering proves the reality of our faith. 
1 Peter 1, 7 says that the genuineness of your faith that is much more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory in God at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So your trials prove that you really believe. They prove your faith. They strengthen your faith, in fact, because God shows himself strong through the trial. Secondly, trials enable us to comfort others who are going through similar trials. And if you've ever been through a major time of grief or pain and you see someone else, you know it, it's not to go up to them and give them all the advice. It's to go up and say, I'm with you. I, I hear you. I, I see you. I know you, what you're going through to some degree, and I'm praying for you. Second Corinthians chapter 1, that we may comfort others with the same comfort that we have received. A third reason we go through trials is to develop godly character. Romans 5 verse 1 tells us trials produce things like perseverance and godly character and hope. A fourth reason is trials motivate us to share the gospel. Read the book of Acts. In the early church, every time they were threatened, every time they were persecuted, every time they suffered, they became more bold about sharing the gospel because they realized what really matters. Jesus, and they became stronger in their witnessing because of suffering. A fifth reason trials come into our life is to remove impurities from our life that otherwise we would never remove. But because God turns up the fire, so to speak, and, and the refining pot, the, those impurities are brought to the surface, and now we're, we're compliant <laughs> we're humbled by trials we're, we're willing to rely on the lord and say if, if i have to surrender that lord i will and those trials help us they test us and they purify us and then a sixth reason is that trials help us to focus on eternal things instead of temporal things second corinthians chapter 4 describes how our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And those trials help us keep our eyes on eternal things so we don't lose heart, so that our inward man, our inward woman, is, is being renewed day by day because we're looking at the things that are eternal and our eyes are off the things that are temporary and we're looking forward in hope and we're growing stronger in the Lord through those trials. He calls it light affliction, but it's creating a greater weight of glory. And although our trials are heavy, just imagine how much weight of glory is coming as we endure those trials and trust the Lord and keep our eyes on heaven and look forward to his return. Now, God will be glorified in our trials if we are relying on him, discovering that his grace is sufficient and allowing the trials to help us know him more and become more like Jesus. And you know, in Jesus Christ, we have a foundation that cannot be moved. We have the personal touch of the comforter who lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit, and we have hope that is beyond this life. And so through many tribulations, we enter the kingdom of God and we will go and be with him in heaven. Embrace the suffering. I know, I, I pray, Lord, take it away. <laughs> Anyone else? Want to confess? <laughs> when we're going through suffering, it's like, Lord, just take it away, whatever it takes. But the Lord actually wants us oftentimes to go through the suffering and to learn what we need to learn through the trial. And so it's a good prayer to pray, Lord, strengthen me for what you're preparing me for, for what you have planned for me. Would you strengthen me in, even in this trial? And so we see here that Paul was a good shepherd, he cared for them. He sacrificed personally. He cared for their growth. He sent Timothy. And he also spoke the hard truths. That's another defining marker of a good shepherd. They'll speak the hard truths. Paul didn't come in to just entertain them. He came to tell them the hard truth, that you're going to go through some hard times, and yet the Lord will be with you. Notice in verse 3, he says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. The word shaken there. Are there any dog lovers in the house? <laughs> Anyone love dogs? The word shaken is actually a word for when a dog wags its tail. 
that's how the Greek word is, was used in that language. It's, it's like a real shaking. And Paul's saying, you know, like a dog gets excited and, and there's lots of movement and shaking, when we're going through a trial, we can be shaken around. And Paul knew that they could become unstable in their faith. They could be tossed to and fro. And so that's why he sends Timothy. That's why Paul had taught them, you're going to suffer at times. And, and Timothy now comes to deepen the roots and to encourage them to, to grow the fruit. And so Paul knew they needed the ministry of Timothy to come. He, they needed someone personally to put their arm around them and encourage them. And it's a great reminder to me, as I read even verse 3, that we're all vulnerable to shaking. And like they needed Timothy, we also need each other. We need the body of Christ. We need relationships. We need to open our lives. One of the reasons we don't isolate ourselves as Christians, but we make an effort to stay in fellowship, is that we all need comfort and encouragement in trials. You say, well, I'm not going through any trials. I don't really need that fellowship then. <laughs> no, no, no. If you're not going through a trial, maybe you need to be together with the body of Christ present so you can offer comfort to someone else and you can put your arm around someone else and encourage them and pray for them. Fellowship doesn't just mean, well, I attended the church service. Fellowship means opening our lives, sharing our battles and our faith. It means being humble enough to actually admit when we're struggling and to ask for prayer. It means being open for God to use us to help others and encourage others who are struggling. To say, you guys, yeah, it's normal that we're struggling. We're all in this battle, but we're in this together. Only Christians understand the, the kind of battle that the other Christians are going through because we have the same enemy. We have the same battle. And we're being tempted. We're being attacked. We're being shaken. And yet Timothy went there in that vulnerable moment to put his arm around them, to deepen their roots and encourage them. So look at verse 5. Paul says, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Interesting here how Paul describes Satan. He calls him by his very nature the tempter, the one who's going to try to push you away from the Lord. And it's interesting to see in this passage, Paul knew something about Satan, that even if God appoints a trial in my life and God allows trials in our lives for all those reasons, yet Satan will come in at that moment and try to exploit the pain, exploit the emotions, exploit the trial and take advantage of it and tempt us away from Christ. Paul knew that about Satan. And again, that's why he sends Timothy. And he's encouraged that Timothy comes back with a good report. Look at verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you, so Paul's about to make a, a statement, but first he, he just says, oh, we've heard the good report, that you're continuing on with the Lord, that you still remember us, your faith is strong, your love is strong, your spiritual condition is good, you're growing. Yes, you're young in your faith, but you're healthy. Paul says we're happy about this good news. And, and, now, and in verse 6, you know, he's really encouraging them that they're continuing on with the Lord. And I think, sorry, <laughs> I think in verse 6, it's really a low-key miracle that's being described, isn't it? These people came to Christ, and this is how it could have played out. Hey, Paul led us to Christ. Woohoo! And then it got hard, and then Paul left, and then it got harder. What's the deal with this? We don't like that guy, Paul. What was he trying to teach us? Why did he set us up for this suffering? But instead, Paul says, oh, man, you guys remember us well, and you're, you're growing in your faith. You know, it's very easy by human nature and by satanic deception to be separating in the body of Christ, to get grumpy with each other, to misunderstand, and to even despise those who have a good intention, those who share the Lord with us and, and share God's word. But these people know miracle upon miracle they're growing and they still love and appreciate what paul gave them in the lord verse 7 and 8 
Paul says something very humble and very honest. Verse 7, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. And now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now, I told you earlier, Paul was in Athens and then Corinth, and it was a time of weakness and trembling in his life. He was depressed. He was discouraged. And yet, how was he lifted up? By Timothy coming back and giving them this report. And he says, it was so refreshing. It put wind in my sails to hear that you guys are growing with the Lord. And I'm always reminded of Proverbs 25, verse 25. It says, as cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. And you know, if you want to refresh others, like these Thessalonians refresh Paul, it's real simple. Keep growing in your walk with Jesus. Keep living for the Lord. And by doing that, others will be encouraged. Others will see your faith, and it will give them wind in their sails. It will help them in their moment of discouragement. You know, oftentimes when you meet someone who's discouraged and they share with you, you're like, oh, what do I do? How do I, how do I encourage someone who's going through a trial? And we think, oh, what's the file I got to open and what, how does that, what are the verses? And, you know, often if you're just growing in the Lord, you'll refresh them because you'll have spent time with Jesus. And what they need in that moment is some comfort from Jesus. And when you've spent time with the Lord, when you're growing, just by being together with them, the Lord will shine through you. The Lord will give you what to say. You spend time with him in the word, you'll have a verse if, if that's what they need because you spend time with the Lord. And so as you abide in Christ, you become an encouragement to others without having to memorize the manual, <laughs> without having to go through a counseling course. If you've got something real with the Lord, you, you can refresh. Verse 9 for what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, verse 9 and 10 is interesting. He says, your faith brings us joy and thanksgiving. Paul was really thanking God. I mean, he went through a lot of suffering. And so when he saw good things, he was, he was you know, suffering makes us more grateful, doesn't it? Makes us more thankful for the good things for the Lord's work. And Paul was a thankful man. And in verse 10, he says, we think about you all the time. We can't wait to see you. We can't wait to come and to assist you in your faith. Notice the interesting phrase at the end of verse 10, and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Paul knew they needed more training. They needed more discipleship. There were things that were still lacking in their relationship with the Lord, in their knowledge of God, in their faith, in their walk. And you know, this is the same for us. We all have a lack in our faith. There's some part of our faith that is not perfect yet. Anyone agree? <laughs> Paul says in another place, I haven't arrived, I haven't attained, I haven't perfected yet. Uh, but I press on that I may grow, that I may know the Lord. And he says, I want to come and help you to greater, complete maturity in your faith. And so we all need to keep growing. We all need to look at those areas we have strengths. I think everyone here has gifts, has strengths of, of what God has built and established in your life. And it's great to focus on those strengths and use them for the Lord. Sometimes we, we don't like to look at our weaknesses. We don't like to bring it to the surface. We don't like to expose it to the Lord and, and even to a, a brother or sister in Christ. But we all have areas that are lacking in our faith. And it's through trials that those deeper lessons are learned, that we, that we really grow in those areas. It's through trials, but it's also through that discipleship. As Paul was saying, I can't wait to come to you and help you in those areas. Look at verse uh, 11 to 13. As we finish the chapter, we see Paul's love for these people expressed in a prayer. And he's He's going to pray this, and it's almost like he's writing his prayer. I don't know if you ever write out your prayers. I do sometimes because then I can come back and pray them again, and I don't forget them. <laughs> and Paul expresses his written prayer, verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Verse 11, simple. We're praying that God will open a door 
and send us to you in person. And let me just say, for those who are watching online, I pray this for you, that God will open a door for you to be back here with us soon in person. And I pray that for all of us, that we can, when we're here, really open our lives and grow deeper and be connected. And that's a good prayer, that the Lord will direct our way to each other. Verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we to you. So a prayer is that they will grow in love. Now, I said at the beginning of the service, there are kind of three gauges of spiritual health. One is how we endure trials. We've talked about that today. God will comfort you. There's a reason you're going through a trial. And God will reveal it. God will show you. God will help you. Don't be shaken. And open your life and be, let, 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 let encouragement come in. But I also said there's two other gauges. We'll talk about them more next time. You see in verse 12, love, that you may grow in loving one another. And this is a great gauge of spiritual health. How's your love for others? And then look at verse 13. He talks about praying for holiness. He says that God may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Oh, I'm praying that you'll keep growing in purity. Next week, we'll talk about the love and the purity. And we'll go a bit deeper into verse 12 and 13 because we're we're out of time today. And I knew we could really only bite off one of these big applications, which is today, suffering. Are you going through a trial? I'm praying for you. And you know what the Bible says is that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is in heaven praying for you. He's making intercession for you. Do you know someone's praying for you right now? And his name is Jesus? And he's talking to his father about you and what you're going through, praying that God will send help, God will send comfort, God will send strength, God will send wisdom, God will send a a believer into your life to help you. Jesus is praying for you. I'm reminded of Peter. Right before he, you know, Jesus is going to go to the cross, and Peter's saying, I won't deny you. Remember what Jesus had said to him? Peter, Satan has asked after you that he may sift you and shake you, sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, but I've prayed for you. And yet, you know what? God allowed Satan to really shake Peter. Remember, he went through a great trial when he denied Christ. I I don't know him. I don't know him. He was being shaken by the devil. But Jesus had prayed for him. And so Jesus strengthened him and Jesus restored him and Jesus forgave him. And And Jesus said to him, Peter, when you return, go and strengthen others. I love that. The Lord wants us to know that if we're going through a trial, he is praying for you. If he's allowed a trial in your life, he will put a limit on what Satan can do. Read the story of Job. God always puts a limit. But yet God has a purpose. And God wants you to rely on him and to grow closer to the Lord and even to the church family, to other believers and to grow your roots deeper and to bring forth more fruit. And that's why we're going through trials. We must, sorry, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. That's the hard truth. But I'm not here to entertain. I'm here like Paul and Timothy to to share the comforting news that Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He says, I've overcome the world. Back to the gardening analogy. If you look out at a tree and you think, oh, look, I got an apple tree. We, we have one outside of our uh, kitchen. And it doesn't really produce great apples. <laughs> sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're, they're awful. And, you know, if Megan's there and she's going, ah, I just want those, that tree to be good and it's got all these rotten apples and they're gross and they're small and they're, ah. And she goes, I know what will fix this. And she told me to tell, say this story, this analogy, because she thought of it. It was really good. <laughs> and, and she said, what if I go to the grocery store and I buy a whole bunch of fresh, beautiful apples, and then I go to the tree and I take down all the rotten, ugly ones, and then I get the, the masking tape out and tape all the good ones to the tree. Does that really solve the problem? No. You know, if you've got a fruit problem, you've really got a root problem. And God wants you to grow deeper. God wants you 
to take your time in the word of God, to be established, and then to be encouraged and strengthened, and then to turn around and give that to others. And as we rely on Christ, our roots will become healthy. Maybe the trial you're going through is because the Lord wants to deepen your roots right now. He wants to deepen your faith. He wants to draw you closer to him. And as the roots get healthier, the fruit will naturally become more healthy. And there'll be much more love, much more joy, much more purity, much more desire to follow the Lord and strength to do so. Again, put your spiritual walk first. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else. God will work it out. God will bless you. God will bring it together. So here's the question as we close. How do I grow healthy roots? How do I build my life and my faith so it's strong, so the fruit becomes good? How do I grow? Three things, as we've seen in the Word today. Study the Scriptures and learn from the apostles like Paul and Timothy and these guys and learn from the Word of God. Secondly, stay in fellowship. Open your life. And thirdly, trust God through the trials. And in the trials, God will help you to grow in ways that you didn't imagine possible. Let's pray together. You know, a good prayer is this prayer. Lord, strengthen me for what you have planned for me. And Lord, this is our prayer today. Would you strengthen us? And you know what's around the next corner. You know what you have prepared and what you've planned, what you want to do in our lives. And Lord, we've got to say, Lord, help us to be close with you, to put you first, to walk with you. And Lord, help us to be spiritually strong, growing in you. Would you deepen our roots? Would you deepen our faith? Would you open our lives in fellowship? And would you allow us to receive that love and give that love to one another? And would you help us to be a refreshment? And Lord, I pray that this body, this family, would keep growing strong. And that our faith would be, Lord, you know what's lacking. Would you help us to grow? And Lord, we receive your strength today. We receive your grace. And we ask you to help us even through the trials. In Jesus' name, amen.